Thank you very much. Good morning. Today I'd like to talk about the use of artificial intelligence uh, to create better outcomes in our educational systems. I'm asking everybody to think a little bit about artificial intelligence because it's all around us now. And I'd like you to think a little bit about how artificial intelligence can impact our educational outcomes, not just for us, but from everybody around the world. Just to give you a quick background about myself, uh, I'm a solutions architect. Uh, and a solution architect is a person who sits down with a business unit, asks them about their really hard problems, and then starts to integrate new uh, technologies to help them solve those problems. I should also tell you a little bit about me. I'm dyslexic. Uh, when I was in high school, I thought I was actually the dumbest kid in the room because I had a lot of problems with language. It took me a long time to realize that certain parts of my brain were ideal for matching business problems to complex solutions and to visualizing complex data inside of computer systems. So I'd like you to take a little thought experiment here. I'd like to say in a couple of years, you're going to go to your website of your high school, uh, and you're going to see this little chat bot in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and when you click on that chat bot, it might say, what would you like to learn today? And you'd say, hmm, chat bot. I've always wanted to learn how to write a chat bot. And so uh, you'll start to say, uh, uh, I'd like to learn how to write a chatbot in the chatbot, and it's going to start to ask you a series of questions. It might first ask, have you ever heard of the Python programming language? And you'll say, yep, I took a class in that. Uh, how about natural language processing? No, I don't know anything about that. And then what about graph databases? Have you heard about those? And you'll say, uh, no, I haven't had that before. And so what that chatbot's going to do is it's going to think for a while, and then it's going to ask the question, is this an appropriate lesson plan for you? And it's going to have a lot of content in that. It might start out with some Wikipedia pages that it would recommend. It might then give you some online classes that you could take, some YouTube videos you could watch. You could even have it download software packages to build your own chatbot. It might suggest examples within those software packages to get you started. But now we're in the area that lots of data is connected. We're on Facebook, we're on all these other systems, and it might look into those systems and say, hey, I found a teacher at your school who's also interested in this topic. Maybe you should stop by and talk to them. Oh, and wait, there are mentors uh, within your area that I've also been volunteering to teach AI and chatbots to other schools. Oh, and by the way, here's some other sample code that students have been writing within your city. Uh, and then, by the way, there's a high school down the road, Washburn High School, that has a chatbot club that meets every Tuesday. Maybe you should join them. And then it's also going to give you two other things. It's going to say, if you do this on your own, I'm going to give you a 30% probability that you're going to achieve your objectives. But if you include a mentor, and if you include a social contact with other friends that are doing this, I'm going to give you a 95% probability you'll be able to write a chatbot. And so how you learn is also important about what you're learning. So I've been thinking about this for about 25 years, ever since I read this book, uh, a 1995 book, uh, by Neil Stevenson called Diamond Age. Now, Diamond Age, if you know of the Stone Age, uh, the Bronze Age, uh, the Information Age, Diamond Age is the era where we can create anything at will out of any material, the age where we've conquered the small, the age of nanotechnology. And even though Neil Stephen talks about building things with diamonds, that's not the important thing. The important thing is what would happen if we could create a book that looks like a lot like an iPad, and it would customize an educational experience exactly to the needs of the student at any time. And it was his vision of the future that has really inspired me to think deeply about what AI can do to education. So uh, when we think of an intelligent agent like a chatbot, we start to ask questions. How would we build such a thing? Uh, would each school have its own chatbot, or could we share chatbots across Minnesota or the United States? Uh, how would they build it? 
Who could use these chatbots? Would there be a fee? What would, there, what would the cost? And what types of data would this chatbot need to ingest to be able to make these recommendations? Uh, what I want to also mention is that this goes back in history and looking at all of these algorithms and data structures and thinking of how they work together uh, is a way that we can deconstruct things. So let's just talk a little bit about how we store data today. And uh, if you can go back 5,000 years to the cuneiform tablets, uh, you know that we have been storing data in rows and columns for 5,000 years. Uh, Aluk owes uh, Ashun uh, 50,000 uh, or 5,000 barrels of grain at the end of the harvest season. Right? Uh, we also use uh, tabular things for shikard looms, for holler inch punch cards, and then uh, VisiCalc was the very first spreadsheet. And what we see is that we have thousands and thousands of these disconnected data sources. And as an architect, I can't bring that all together to solve problems. What I want you to think about is that our brains don't store tabular data. Our brains are vast networks of neurons that are connected uh, through edges. Uh, and we call these uh, brains uh, uh, graph systems. Uh, and what we're seeing is that even though there's 84,000 uh, neurons, all of them can communicate in parallel, and all of them solve problems quickly for us. So uh, as an architect, uh, my job then is to use all of these different architectural patterns and make a recommendation to our customers about what is the right structure to solve various business problems. Uh, the most important one that's emerging is not the tabular structure of disconnected islands of information, but these connected knowledge graphs, enterprise knowledge graphs. And we're seeing many organizations that have never built, built these before be very successful because they're taking this graph approach. If you think of social media sites, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, all of them are powered by graph databases. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about how we would represent learning knowledge in a graph. Uh, if you wanted to master a topic like arithmetic, it requires that you are also mastering concepts that depend on that. So to master arithmetic, you'd have to say, I have to be able to understand addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So what we then do is we build these topic maps. We say, have a dependency list, and say, if you want to achieve an objective on the right, you have to understand the concepts on the left. These are called concept dependency graphs. Um, and so for each student now, we have to know what material you know what concepts you've mastered, what material you don't know because you don't know their dependencies. And most important for a recommendation engine of content, we have to know this narrow strip of information in the middle of what you, have read, ready to, what you are ready to learn. So now if you can imagine for every course that you've taken that there are about 10,000 concepts that you need to master. And as you master them, a system can mark them as done. We know that. Uh, we know you know about Python, but we know that you also need background in other areas uh, like graph databases and uh, natural language processing. But once you've mastered those, you are ready to build a chatbot. So now what we see is that we have this interesting thing for each student. Every student, we represent their knowledge space. And if you're a mentor, you're a teacher, your job is to build a mental model of your students of what they know and what they don't know and what they are ready to learn. And that's how we can uh, best build intelligent agents to adapt the needs to each of those users. All right, so I also, now that you've had an introduction to this thing called concept space, I'd like to also introduce you to another related space called content space. They sound similar, but they're very different. Concepts are abstract things that depend on each other, that have names, that we build curriculum around. But content is actually what a recommendation engine is going to give us. Right? And those can be a book, they can be Wikipedia pages, they can be videos, they can be labs, but they can also be resources like mentors or other students that you want to interact with. So what do, uh, now that we've looked at the data structures, let's look at the algorithms that fit these data structures together. 
And the fundamental algorithm I would like to talk to you about is something called a recommendation algorithm. And it says, if you like x, then you will like y. But it goes beyond is just you. It looks at people like you. So similarity calculations have to also be done in real time very fast. Uh, and there's a wonderful algorithm called cosine similarity for people that like trigonometry to see whether your vector of interest is aligned with their interest of vectors and recommend their, take their recommendations into account when you're trying to decide how to learn things. So you probably use recommendation systems almost every day. Every time you go to the Netflix site, it's going to recommend which, which uh, things you'd like to watch. If you search things on Google, it will also recommend things. If you go to Amazon, it'll not only look at the books and the products, but it'll also look at all the other people that have recommended those systems and take those into account. If you go to Pinterest and you look at an interest, they'll also recommend other things you might be interested in. Uh, if you go to Facebook, you'll also re get uh, friends' recommendations. So what do these things all have in common? They all have about 100 billion facts stored in a graph, and their job is to take the knowledge in that graph, traverse it in real time, and recommend what you should be studying, what, you sh what content you should be doing. So these systems are now prevalent in many systems. Uh, they they uh, save companies billions of dollars, uh, and they also help revenue. And the question is, who's going to build the recommendation systems of the future in education? So computers can do many things. They can take a lot of the drudgery out of our grading systems and our scoring system. They can now automatically read your essays like Grammarly and give you suggestions on syntax and word choice. Uh, they listen to speaking in foreign languages. They can make recommendations on pronunciation. Uh, they can connect you with other people of central interest. But can they connect people with whatever they need to do with their learning objectives? Uh, and that's the real question in front of us, I think. So uh, one of the things I'm asking a lot of people is, is this something that we can crowdsource? Right? Uh, the company that I work with has 300,000 employees. What if each of those employees would put a few facts about what they liked and what they didn't like in training into a database? Could we use those to help guide us uh, and, and other systems? Uh, how do you become a distinguished engineer? You can look at the background of them and what did they choose for their recommendations. So we know that we can crowdsource knowledge. Wikipedia has proved that where millions of people around the world contribute knowledge in a consistent way, and they actually build a graph of content. But the question about knowledge spaces is we also need to customize a series of recommendation engines for each of our students. So what I'd like to do in the future is build something kind of like GitHub, but for knowledge spaces. So GitHub, if you're not familiar with it, is a place where people store their software code and in fact, their software often uses libraries and functions from other software. And we are building this massive knowledge base of things so that when you want to build something, you're actually pulling in this complex dependency graph of software and pulling in the right version of every library. And you do that uh, without actually thinking about it anymore. There are 100 million content repositories in GitHub. What if we could do that same scale for education? Well, we would certainly need standards on how we represent this knowledge and concepts and all of our curriculum and our design. Uh, but what we can see is companies, uh, uh, companies are doing this, and even countries like China are spending billions of dollars to build a shared knowledge graph for all of their students. All right. So this is not something that can be done in isolation, and there's a lot of privacy issues related to this. Uh, what about certain recommendations. What if a student says a course is not very good? Is that, can that be public? Uh, is it private only? How do we decouple a student's identity from their recommendations? Uh, what content should be public? What should be private? Uh, should the average test scores of curriculum be available? Uh, what about automated assessments? Uh, should we allow those to happen? Should computers take over some of the drudgery? Or uh, is that something that we shouldn't be doing? And will these recommendations be biased towards one set of the population or not? 
And that's one of the things in AI we're very, very concerned about conscious and unconscious bias in our systems. So I'd like to end on a positive note. Uh, I fundamentally believe that if you look at the value chain of education and what we spend every day on education, that we can dramatically increase the value that we bring to students, but also make education and content more accessible to everyone, to, de to democratize education across income, across race, across gender, religion, and orientation. Everybody should have equal opportunity for education. So thank you very much.